you know, P30, we're basically just trying to get people on the same page so that people who either are existing investigators or want to be investigators could actually know a bit about PET, uh, maybe more than you currently know if you're new. And so obviously one thing with PET is that you need tracers. And so it's really an informal discussion of what kind of tracers um, we have and that basically gets people thinking a little bit about possible pilot studies because in a month or two we'll have a call for next round of pilots that would be in this grant. So obviously one of the, the feasibility things there is, is what tracers should you be thinking about and what domain should you be thinking about. So it's very informal and uh, Bob Mack, who needs no introduction, will introduce us to Lycus. Okay, thank you Anna Rose. Uh, Yes, Anna Rose asked me to come today to talk uh, a little bit about the, the current radio tracers that the Cyclotron facility uh, is producing, uh, largely in the area of uh, neuroscience research and those which could be available to potential pilot projects. She asked me to not talk about things in the pipeline, but Anna Rose, you know, whenever I give a talk on PET, I always have to talk about the pipeline. Well, I didn't want to feel that you had to be pipeline. <laughs> okay, well, I, I thought, yeah, I, and the pipeline is at different levels, things that were, we have available, but have not really used, but could be used as part of pilot projects, and things that are getting up and online around the P30 that, again, currently aren't online, but are in that pipeline. And then where the, the center, I think, is going, or where my research is going, that could feed back into the center. So just a, a little background about PET and the cyclotron. I think everybody is familiar with what PET is. Um, uh, it's a nuclear medicine imaging technique using these short-lived isotopes. The short-lived isotopes are, um, you can't purchase them to a certain extent, um, and you have to produce them on site. Uh, the machine that produces the, psycho, uh, produces the radio nuclides or radioactivity is called the cyclotron. Here at Penn, we have two cyclotrons. The IBA Cyclone 18-9, that was installed in 2010. That accelerates both protons and, and deuterons. At the energy shown here, 18 MeV and 9 MeV, we largely use it as a proton accelerator because all the, the important radionuclides that we use are, are produced by usually a PN reaction, except for carbon 11, this P alpha reaction. It has the capability of running at very high currents, up to 150 microamps, so we're not running it as high as it could be run. Uh, and, and this is the workhorse cyclotron that produces all the radionuclides that we use for our, our preclinical clinic, and clinical and clinical research studies. We have a, an older machine, and Anna Rosa, maybe some of the, and Chuck, some of the people who've been around for a while remember this machine. It's a Japan Steelworks BC3015. It was installed in 1986. It has the ability of, of accelerating multiple particles, protons, deuterons, helium-3, and all those particles. Um, it was, the cyclotron is the one we originally used for producing F-18 and carbon-11 and O-15, but uh, in recent years we have converted it over to a dedicated alpha uh, uh, accelerator. And we largely produce acetate 211 as part of this uh, targeted alpha therapy program as part of the, uh, the, the cancer center here. So um, I really won't talk about the, the JSW, but uh, for those of you who have been here for a while, you remember the JSW. It is still here. It is no longer producing the isotopes for PET, but it is uh, very actively being used in our cancer program. So the cyclotron facility schematic is shown here. Uh, we have this part of the facility in blue, which is the old facility that was basically built in 1986. We have this new part of the facility here, uh, where that's the GMP area. We have the two cyclotrons. Let's see if I can do this without advancing the slide. Uh, this is where the JSW is, and this is where the IBA cyclotron is. We, we do all of our F-18 and carbon-11 studies for our uh, clinical research studies and, and, and clinical studies in this facility here. 
F-18 is in this room, carve at 11. I don't see the pointer in here. Yeah. Is it up there? Nope. Uh, go to the little drop down menu. There. I guess the little cursor. It show, show cursor. Um, you want me to do this for you? I can't, I don't have my glasses on. I can't. Let's see. Here. So the, the, the peach area is the GMP area. Um, we have carbon 11 and F18 being down there. We have a QC lab for doing all of our quality control testing for things that are released for human imaging studies. And we have this one area that's called radio pharmacy that used to be a research lab for doing the F18 chemistry. It was converted to a, a radio pharmacy because we have plans that to split doses, to send doses to other hospitals located within the, uh, the hub network, and that's all being done in the, in the radio pharmacy. Yeah, thanks, Tom, for taking care of that. And we have hot cells in the old area here for doing the animal studies. Here are the, the pictures of the hot cells shown up here. Here are the older hot cells for animal research, and here's the see that shown up here. So this is uh, the facility, and I think you're gonna get a tour of the facility in a few weeks. Uh, from Sharon. And this is a cyclotron facility org chart that the people involved in uh, this operation. Uh, I'm at the top uh, because basically I get to give the presentations and ask everyone for money when we need stuff, and that's really where my role ends. The main person that you'll be interacting with is Sharon Lee. She is the cyclotron facility operations manager, and she basically runs the, the cyclotron facility on a day to day basis. We have a you know, a couple of committees that oversee this operation, the Quality Assurance Committee, which just uh, deals with regulatory compliance. Uh, Swalomer uh, Zeminski is the head of the quality, uh, he's our compliance, quality compliance manager, and he uh, uh, basically is responsible for making sure that we are certainly uh, um, not in good shape when it comes to uh, FDA inspections. Uh, the staff here, we have two cyclotron engineers, Larry Toto and Dave Shaw. We have a radio chemist here, Alex Schmitz, our head radio chemist, Prashant Gossett and Shihan. Gossett actually uh, does FDG production, so if he works with the bull, he comes in at uh, 4 a.m. in the morning to make FDG. And then when he's done with that, he comes over and doubles up and does some productions, F-18 production side in, uh, in support of our IG based stuff. And three of my postdocs here that uh, work in the lab and, and do uh, the research runs mostly for animal research. Um, yeah, for Shank and Shihong, who also uh, came with me from, from Wash U, have a lot of experience in radio chemistry. And we have a, our quality control manager is Yuti, uh, with his Yu Ming Kuo. And uh, we recently brought in <coughs> Yu Ting Lu as a, a, another quality control person. So, this may sound like a lot of people, it's really not. When you look at all the things that we do, uh, on the way over here, I was, I was telling Tom and Catherine, I think that our cyclotron facility is probably a third the size of the program we had at Wash U. Wouldn't you agree with Sharon? It's, it's a really lean facility, and uh, you know, we're able to, to do what we have promised to do. We're able to wrap up and get some things online, but I, I do think the time is going to come where we're gonna have to uh, hire more radio chemistry staff to, to meet the needs as, uh, as the P30 grows and as the P30 leads to uh, growth in the program through pilot projects leading to, uh, to R01 funded, funded projects. So, so this is the, the organizational chart as it exists and it will change according to time. Okay, so let's talk about some of the tracers that we have up and running and that are really available right now for human imaging studies if you'd like to do so. So the, the top one is f 18 fa uh, That is a, a, a tracer that buys the alpha-4 beta-2 nicotinic receptors. And this is a, a study that uh, Jake Dubroff has been leading for a while. And, and I'll show you some of his data in a few minutes. Carbon-11 carfentanil is a tracer that was brought online years ago. It was back burnered and recently brought online uh, for the P30. And one of the delays for getting carbon 11 carfentanil online is we had to be certified as a schedule uh, two manufacturer. And I just was approved for, my DEA license was just uh, amended for that purpose in the end of December. So. 
We are now ramping up and making carbon-11 carbon fentanyl. We hope to have that available for, for some of our newer studies soon. Uh, we had a, a tracer that had a lot of uh, a, a lot of interest that and we, a lot of hope that would work. Our D3 tracer F18 for pride. The reason it's uh, crossed out is that we know that uh, that tracer really didn't pan out. Uh, it was an interesting thing where it actually looked pretty good in non-human primates and when we you know one of the key things in determining how brain uptake of a pet probe is its free fraction you really want to have a free fraction of at least two percent maybe higher hopefully around five percent in non-human primates the, the free fraction of ftp was like two to three percent that worked well when we took it into humans and made, made it, we had very little brain uptake um, we went back and looked at the free fraction measurements and the free fraction measure was 0.1%, which is the first time that I have encountered that where there was a huge difference in free fraction between non-human primates and humans, but we think that along with a couple of other things really led to the demise of FTP. So uh, as you'll see, I'll talk a little bit about it, uh, the D3 is still an active area of research since my R01 is up for competing renewal in, <laughs> in a year, I think we have to wow. make it a top priority wow. going forward. We have a, a F18 fluoroscopy here that is available for uh, the, the, the tauopathies, particularly in Alzheimer's disease, and doesn't work for the other four R tauopathies. We have F18 fluoroscopy that was uh, recently we converted this over to the nucleophilic method for making fluoroscopy, and, and are we we are doing some Parkinson's disease studies, correct, Sharon? Not yet. No, we 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 mainly use a uh, ship it to chop for yeah. uh, hyperinsomnia and they for hyperinsomnia and uh, also we we we'll, we'll also use it as an imaging study for a neurosurgery. Um, I guess in that we're looking at the okay. sector. Yeah, yeah. So so that is available. It's a very old tracer, it's been around for a long time, but it does measure the uh, dopamine terminal density. The carbon 11 acetate is an interesting one. It uh, measures uh, oxidative metabolism in the heart, and it's been mostly been used for that. But there are a few studies out there that have shown that you know acetate is used exclusively by astrocytes. So we're using carbon 11 acetate to uh, look at astrocyte activity in uh, neurodegeneration in uh, Ilya Navrala is leading that area of the pilot project for looking at that. Uh, F18 NOS is the INOS tracer that I developed while I was at Wash U, and I'll show you, talk a little bit about that in a minute. And carbon 11 PBR28 was developed by Victor Pike, and Bob Innes at the intramural program NIMH, and that measures the TSBO. And, and again, we'll talk a little bit about that. So these are all tracers that, if one wants to do human imaging studies, one can do. Very quickly, all you need to do is get all the protocols in and, and the IND. So, so this is 2FA. This is a study that was published by by Jake and uh, Karen Lerman uh, a, a few years ago. And and in this study, what they were doing is they were looking at differences in receptor occupancy in smokers who had this uh, genetic variant that had either normal metabolizers or the, the variant uh, had a very slow metabolism of nicotine, and they found that. The people who uh, were the slow metabolizers, there was prolonged occupancy of the nicotinic receptors relative to the normal metabolizers. And they showed this in this, this paper that was published in uh, the Journal of Nuclear Medicine in, in 2015. Well, why am I showing this? Is well, we recently went back and, and looked at this data. And this was a study that was done by Evan Gallagher, he's a, a neuroscience graduate student in my group. I think he worked with Robert Ude on this, but he certainly worked with Jake Dubroff on this. And we went back and we, we reanalyzed the data because we know that with respect to the thalamus, which is the, the hot spot where most of these receptors are localized, that the, the density of the receptor is not uniform about the thalamus. There are some structures within the thalamus where the density is higher than others. So what Evan did is he did his MR segmentation and reanalyzed the PET data and tried to segment the, uh, uh, the regions of the thalamus to look at separated into regions of high uptake versus low uptake, and, and that's what's shown here. And he was able to go back and, and show that actually the, 
the PET data is tracked quite nicely with other reports from autoradiography of the density of the receptor. So, so this is a, a new way of which we're analyzing uh, the nicotine studies. Why this is important for the P30 is that the kappa opiate receptor has a, it's a, a similar type uh, question with that, that uh, uh, a region of interest for that is a, is a thalamus. Uh, this is a, a PET study that Jake sent me to me earlier today. I can't remember which group published this, but the reference is shown there. And you can see that there are regions of high intensity and lower intensity in the thalamus. So these uh, segmentation methods that they were currently developing and have developed for the nicotine tracer are going to apply, apply for the, the carbon 11 carfentanil. And carbon 11 carfentanil is a type O, it is not a kappa. It's a U opiate receptor, so very disappointed that no one point, didn't point that out quicker. What, what, what about dimorphin? Uh, it's a, normally the capo on that, right? For pet? Well, no, I'm thinking physiologically. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I guess I, I don't call myself a, 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 an opiate expert, but uh, but the pet tracer that we use is for the new opioid. So, so there's cross reactivity between you and kappa and the system. Is there is carfet? I thought carfet no, no, was slightly different. This is just a typo. This is just a typo. This is a typo in the slide. Typo in the slide. Yeah. It, it should it should be. Oh, it should be mu. It's mu, not yeah. yeah. We're looking okay. at mu. So <clears throat> I I have a a very bad typo for this crap. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So let's spend a moment talking about uh, neural inflammation. Uh, those of you who probably haven't followed the pet literature as closely as others are, are familiar with this, but this has been a, a very, very popular area of research over the past five to 10 years. And the reason being is it's neural inflammation is thought to play a key role in neurodegeneration. So people are coming up with different strategies for imaging neural inflammation, that the main strategy that people are focused on and the main protein is this uh, protein here called TSPO, it stands for the translocator protein. Uh, a few years ago, it was called the peripheral benzodiazepine receptor, but they, about five years ago, or maybe even longer, they, they changed this name to the translocator protein or the TSPO. Um, there are some ligands that bind to the TSPO. The, the one drawback to the TSPO is it's expressed on a lot of glial cells that are activated in neuroinflammation, both uh, microglial, it's in astrocytes, and it's also in, in, uh, in the invading uh, monocytes that occur from the, the peripheral and, and, and inflammatory mechanism. So it, it looks at, it measures a lot of things that are going on in the neuroinflammatory process, but it seems to be the tracer that most people are, have focused on. Uh, other people have looked at P2X7, COX2, uh, the cannabinoid receptors, a little bit further back in development. But by and large, the, the one that seems to, to be the, 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 the protein that people have been focusing on the most is the uh, TSPO. The first compound that people focus on is carbon 11 PK11195, and this was actually made here, I believe, at Penn long before I arrived. Now, the problem with PK11195 is that uh, it is specific for the TSPO, but the, the non specific binding is quite high, so the signal to noise ratio wasn't good. So, what people have been trying to do is come up with these second generation TSPO. Uh, Radio tracers, a lot of this has been done at NIMH and Bob Innes and Victor Pike's program, as well in Australia and in Europe. Everybody has uh, a lot of groups are trying to come up with their, their own version of uh, the TSBO ligand. Uh, the one that seems to people have settled on the most is carbon 11 PBR28. This compound binds potently to the TSBO, has lower <coughs> non specific binding. But the main problem with uh, the second generation TSBO ligands. Uh, PBR28, as well as all the other ones shown in that, that middle part of the slide, is that they have what's called the low binder effect. And what the low binder effect is that there's a, a, a single nucleotide polymorphism in a protein that results in a dramatic reduction in affinity of these second generation <coughs> probes to the TSPO. 
That surprisingly is not a problem with PK11195, but it is a problem with every second generation TSBO ligand developed to date. So if you are homozygous for without the SNP, you have very good binding. If you're homozygous for the SNP, you have no binding. Huh. If you're heterozygous with the SNP, you're right in between. Wow. So what you need to do if when using these tracers is you have to do a very, you know, you have to screen for these patients to know whether or not they, they have this uh, the SNP for the low binder effect. Mm -hmm. And I think by and large people will screen out the people who are heterozygous for the SNP will look at the homozygous as long as your control group has a homozygous set uh, for the SNP as well. well. There's some very recent third generation compounds that, that are based. Make sense. They, they, they do the opposite homozygotes, even the ones that, or they do the heterozygotes and the binding They do the heterozygotes and the people without the SNP. Got okay. without, you. Without the mark, yeah, okay. Yeah, if you have this, if sense. you're homozygous with the SNP, there's no binding, so they, they weak up. They, so they, they right. don't bother imaging those. Got it. So, so there's some third generation compounds. One's an analog of PK11195, one's a GE compound that are reported to, to not have this low binder effect, but the, the, the jury is still out on, on uh, those compounds as well as, as to how true that, that, that statement actually, actually is. Is there anything interesting about those people that have poor binding? I mean, or is it, or is it just I don't a, think so. It's, they're not, not, it's not a meaningful SNP, it's just one of these things? Yeah, but I, I think the only thing the SNP does is influence the binding of the SNP growth. It doesn't really Isn't that interesting? anything else, as, as far as I know. So it's just okay. an annoyance. <laughs> and, and here's a, a study that was published a couple of years ago uh, using carbon PBR28 and Alzheimer's disease. I think we have a protocol here looking at it in Alzheimer's disease and, and um, ALS that's uh, coming online. And uh, that's one of the tracers that Sharon and the group in the cyclotron facility is, is getting online and, and hope to have up and running very soon. What my group has been focusing on is different ways of imaging uh, neuroinflammation. We focus on oxidative stress. I think you may have heard me speak before. We have tracers that are looking at superoxide and we're looking at INOS. These are uh, both of these, uh, both INOS and superoxide, which is produced by NADPH oxidase, are formed in under the, the bad form of neural inflammation, that pro-inflammatory mechanism. So if you have INOS, you have high levels of superoxide, usually bad things are happening in your brain. So, so uh, this is our, our INOS tracer. We initially validated in this preclinical model of lung injury. Delphine Chen, when I was at WashU, did a lung imaging study looking at endotoxin, where she infused the left lung with endotoxin and used the right lung as a control. And she saw a difference between the, uh, the, the endotoxin treated lung versus, I guess it was the right lung that was treated and the left lung as a control. But the, the point is you can see differences in the, the lung that received endotoxin versus the, uh, the control lung. And the, she did a gavage of those lung, uh, of those patients and found that the uptake in the endotoxin treated lung actually correlated with the infiltrating macrophages. So, and, and INOS positive macrophages. So that showed us that the signal, increase in signal we were getting was due to the invasion of, of INOS positive cells. We also, as I said, we were interested in looking at this in, as a marker of neuroinflammation. We did a, a non-human primate imaging study here at, at Penn with INOS and a rhesus monkey because this is a control monkey and there's no elevation in INOS at the tracer gets in the brain very well and washes out. Here are the time activity curves. You can see that very high SUV. It, it peaks very early around 10 minutes, washes out very quickly. And um, here's some preliminary human imaging studies in our control group. Uh, this is a young control. We can see again, very high uptake, washes out rapidly. The, the thing that uh, always had me concerned about INOS is when it comes to potency for inhibiting the enzyme, it's not great. And I worry about the kinetics of the tracer um, being too fast. So what we're looking for when we do our, our uh, patient groups, and the first group that we're looking at are patients with Parkinson's disease, is we look, we're looking for differences between the, between the 10 to 20 difference, the 10 to 20 minute difference. 
that's where we're expecting to see a, uh, uh, um, the difference in uptake between the control group. Again, the kinetics of this tracer are very fast. What we're hoping is that in this region here, the, the washout is a little bit slower than what we see in the control group, and it'll actually give us an imageable signal. But I, I, I worry about this tracer because of its fast kinetics. I was, uh, but there's a lot of interest in imaging neural inflammation and neurodegeneration, and uh, uh, we decided to go ahead and, and give it a shot. And the Fox Foundation funded this study because they're 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 very interested in studying neural inflammation in Parkinson's disease. They grow, like the TSPO ligands. And they actually they basically gave us the money to do this study. And that's the only reason why we decided to do this is because they, they wanted it done and they, they said, here, do a, a very limited study in Parkinson's disease patients and show us if you, you see something. We're also doing a study with um, lung, right? With yes. uh, the Ray, vaping? Regus pilot. Regus pilot, yeah. And that's kind of related to the, the Delphine study that she did. And I, I don't know what the results of that study are. I think they're, they're still analyzing that. Okay, so that's one tracer. And that was also one of the ones going to be used in Becky's study too, right? Yep. They asked yeah. us for, for the Yeah, that's HIV, right? right? HIV plus OUD. Yeah, if we don't see a good <laughs> signal there, then, then, then we're not going to see a signal yeah. <laughs> with right. FNOS. So, so I'm very curious to, to see that data once we, we start to right. do this study. Right. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's great. It gets in the brain very well. It's, it's, it, what we're just hoping is that you see some delay in the washout that we're able to actually quantify an image. Uh, another tracer that a lot of people are interested in, and, and it's, it's not available for human use yet, but there's a lot of people trying to push me in that direction, is uh, F-18 Ross Trace. Ross Trace is interesting because it's, uh, it has this, this carbon-nitrogen saturated bond here and the parent molecule, and that when this reacts with superoxide, what happens is that bond is oxidized up to a charged species and is trapped in tissue that has elevated amounts of superoxide. And this is something that occurs in brain. It occurs in brain as part because of Because it becomes hydrophilic? I'm sorry? It becomes hydrophilic? Yeah, it's actually very hydrophilic. No it's charged. Liquid? Yeah. It's yeah. charged and it can't exit the brain. It, can, it, gets, it crosses the blood brain very, very well when it's uh, reduced, but as soon as it's oxidized, it's trapped. Yeah. Like, a, like a Roach Motel, you can go in but not out. Yeah, kind of like FTG does the same thing. FTG goes in and it's phosphorylated Something. and it's trapped. So the amount that's <laughs> trapped in the brain is dependent upon the levels of superoxide are there. And we validated this in a model of a, the LPS model of neural inflammation. We found that when you do staining, the nice thing about the compound is it's fluorescent so we can track where it is. We looked at microglial, we looked at astrocytes, and we looked at neurons. And it, long story short, is what we're seeing in this LPS model is that it's taken up in the microglial, and it's, it's oxidized and trapped in the microglial and in the neurons, but it wasn't found in the astrocyte. So that, uh, that, that's interesting. So it's, you know, we're able to actually see where the tracer winds up and actually what, what it is we're actually measuring by doing these co-localization studies. Um, this is why the Michael J. Fox Foundation is now pushing me to take this in the human next. This is the uh, A53T model developed by Virginia Lee and Calvin Luke. Here at Penn, these, model, these mice overexpress human alpha synuclein, and we know at about seven to eight months, they start to form Lewy body-like pathology. When we do the imaging study in these mice with raw trace, what you see is an increase in uptake and trapping right around the time this Lewy body pathology starts to form in mice. Uh, we actually, after we did the imaging study, we, we removed the brain, we looked at, uh, uh, we did uh, statistical parametric mapping of the PET studies, we stained for aggregated alpha-synuclein, and we found that the localization of the pet probe actually quite nice, it matched quite nicely regions of the brain that had high synuclein pathology. So we think this, this has a, a lot of promise in, in looking at uh, uh, the bad form of neural inflammation that leads to elevated levels of, of superoxide. And we did a monkey imaging study and it gets in the brain very well and because this is a control animal, it washes out very really well. So, so we're looking to take this into humans next and hopefully within a year we'll, we'll have this ready to go in, in humans. So it's sort of complementary to 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And using it, you provided it to Yale. Right? Yale is currently, as part of the P30, looking at this in their non-human primate model of LPS. So the the one that I started out with with uh, that was a mouse model of LPS-induced neural inflammation. They're they're looking at it in the monkey model as well. So they're actually starting and doing those imaging studies now. Uh, other tracers, uh, things that have been labeled and can be taken into humans if needed because they have they're, they're used around the world as a this D1 compound and NC112, phthalopride and rapapride uh, was used here at Penn years ago, but not so much in recent years, and carbon 11 dihydrotetrabenazine, which measures uh, the DMAT, the transporter and the presynaptic dopaminergic terminals. Um, this is NNC112. The, the thing about NNC112 is it binds to both D1 receptors and it has a high affinity for serotonin 5-HD2A receptors. So in, in this study, uh, this came out of the uh, Imperial College and uh, actually a group in, in London. Um, uh, Mark was at, at Columbia. He, he was at Columbia for years and he moved over to Glaxo, right? Yeah, GlaxoSmithKline in London. Oh, yeah. and, and what they did in this study is they, they did a blocking study with a 5-HD2 antagonist enhancer. And, and this was a, a, a caution to the people in the field because people were using this probe to look at cortical D1 receptors. And what they show in this paper that you really can't do that because when you block serotonin receptors in the cortex, <coughs> you basically lose the signal from the D1 ligand. However, it has no effect on uh, the signal in striatal regions, which is really what we're interested in. So mm -hmm. this is, I showed this slide because it, for, for looking at the caudate putamen and the cummins, the serotonin binding really is going to interfere with our measurements. But Cautionary thing. You don't want to look at the cortex there because yeah. that's what people were originally trying to do with this. And mm -hmm. what they were calling was D1 is probably 5-HD2A receptors, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's, because it is in humans, we have this up and running. We, we can bring this online. By the way, 5-HT2A takes on additional interest, you know, with some of the new data coming out with psilocybin and some of the 5-HT2A mm -hmm. kinds of compounds in treatment-resistant depression, something. So you may have people knocking on your door wanting to use it. There are for tracers. Tom, you've shown, is it two way you've talked about, or? Yeah, so there's there's this one, right, of course. But then there's also another one that uh, people are using, which is an agonist, but it's a uh, mix for 5-HT2A, 5-HT2C, but I think they're in different, substantially different regions of the brain and it's being used. And the occupancy data with psilocybin actually looks pretty compelling. Yeah, so Tom has, has talked to me as an interest in the 5-HT2 uh, area, so that, that could work out as, as well. Uh, other things out in the pipeline, uh, there's this tracer here, I thought, uh, FED, it's flow Pride. It turns out to be very highly selected D2 compounds, an interesting story I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, MNI444 finds the adenosine 2A receptors. This was developed at Molecular Neuroimaging, Sharon's former uh, place where she worked before coming to Penn. And this is asterisk because it's also taken into humans and is available for human use. And this compound is the, the Lilly F18 kappa radio tracer that we're getting online as part of the P30. And we're now making it, right, Alex? Is, Alex is optimizing it, so we're trying to get the Lilly. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're optimizing the synthesis of that, and I, and I just spoke about Ross tracer. I will talk about that. So here's a, this is a study I put in of the Kappa. It's out of the Yale group, and I, I put in it for you, Hank. It's actually looking at uh, alcohol drinkers and healthy controls, and it's with the carbon-11 Kappa compound, and they, they found that in the, the alcohol drinking group, there were several regions within the brain where the, the opioid receptor availability was, was lower than the control group. So this is a, it's certainly uh, demonstrates that this is a good tracer for teasing out and measuring differences in kappa receptor density in a uh, uh, substance abuse related disorder and uh, certainly something that uh, we hope to is it, do. Do you know, I, don't, I don't know that tracer, I don't know all of them, but basically is that a competition kind of tracer or is it an actual availability, you know, like irreversibly bound showing you? It's, a, it's, a, it's an antagonist that binds reversibly. Okay. All right. So yeah, yeah. It's a, okay. It's a, it's a, They've gone on to show that this 
finding predicts response to naltrexone. Okay. In the short term exposure. And Yale is a participating site in the P30, and they're very helpful in our getting uh, the catheter tracer. We're using the F18 tracer, and we're getting that on, online here. You know, one of the things I just wanted to spend a minute talking about, I, I don't know if I've given this lecture here or given it on Penn, but you know, up until now, people have always seemed to, when they talk about imaging the G proteins, they, they have tended to focus on a single receptor. Two receptor or about D2, D3, because a probe's are selective. I just showed the way for the uh, adenosine. Maybe I haven't shown it the way. It's you haven't shown it here, but you've talked about it it's briefly at lunch or something, but not, you haven't shown it. Uh, right, yeah, I think I, a couple years ago. But you know, one of the things we know about G proteins is that they don't really exist as a monomer. They exist as at least a heterodimer. There's some evidence there that they're higher order ones, and they say either a tetramer or a trimer. And, and it's, it's, and with respect to the D2 receptor, which is probably the most studied protein with PET, it's thought to be a hub receptor, meaning it forms heterodimers and multimer complexes with a bunch of other receptors. So the, I think the point in going forward is when you look at these G protein receptors, particularly with the D2 family receptors, you really can't look at the behavior of one without looking what the other receptors are doing that can form uh, a multimer complex with the D2 receptor. So, so one of the things we're trying to do is make these subtype selective receptors to see how they change relative to each other. And this is the MNI444. It's a very selective for the adenosine 2A receptor and it uh, has reversible binding kinetics and very uh, very good signal to noise ratio, and it looks exactly like a, a D2 image. Look. So I can like say, and this is a monkey study that we did with that here at Penn. The reason I say that is this looks like this compound. This is F18 FEP chloroethyl pride. This is an interesting compound. Anna Rose, you you kind of know a, the brother of this compound. If you put a chlorine atom here, that's FCP, which is the tracer I used to buy a weight. Or days to look at all that. Uh, uh, People here will be resonant to the dominant versus subordinate monkey story. Mm -hmm. And that was fluoroclavopride. That was fluoroclavopride. And fluoroclavopride, when you had that chlorine there, actually binds equally to D2 and D3 receptors, about five nanomolar. But we found that when you get rid of that chlorine atom, you dramatically drop its affinity for D3 whereas you don't have much of an effect on the D2 receptor. So this becomes a highly selected D2 compound. And, and the reason why I like this, and I'm hopefully people get excited about it, is yeah. if you have a highly selected D2 receptor, yeah. then you can see how that D2 receptor yeah. is interacting with other ones without yeah. worrying about crosstalk with the D3 receptor yeah. like you would with the other benzamines that are currently being used. So, so we, we developed this and the non-human primate studies look good. I, I actually would like to take this into humans and try to couple it with, with maybe the D1, D2, the D2A2A or, or some of these other G proteins that are known to form uh, uh, heterodimer complexes with, with the D2 receptor, okay? Um, things in development further back in the pipeline, uh, the D3 tracer. This is something we're, we're actively pursuing right now. It is, um, uh, as I said, because my competing renewal is up this year, I have a couple of chemists practically synthesizing new compounds, <laughs> and we hope to have something ready to go in imaging studies uh, by the summertime to set up my, uh, my competing renewal. The Delta receptor is a project that Tom has gotten interested in. As you know, we, we proposed as part of the P30 grant using uh, yeah, not carbon, yeah, yeah. methyl Chris is right on your left. Yeah. 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 Which is horrible. Pet tracers, <laughs> kinetics are, are absolutely horrible. It's next to impossible to try to quantify. But we put it in the grant that because we, we felt we had to look at all three subtypes, but we knew. If this uh, P30 was funded, one of the first things we're going to try to focus on is replacing the delta ligand with something better, and I'll, I'll talk about what our strategy is next. And then I have this U19 grant looking at the 4R tau and the alpha-synithium, which I, I really want to talk about. 
So, so Tom became quite interested in the Delta receptor when he first joined my group in September, and he did a patent search, and he found a, a couple of really potent and selective Delta agonists, right? right. And the, the thing about the Delta compounds and the thing about these compounds is they bind with very high affinity, they're very selective, but some of them bind or substrates for peak lipoprotein. Right. right. Well, the previous generation of compounds like SNC really a chemical matter. So, so what Tom is doing is he's looked at the structure of the molecule and he's altered the structure in a way where we, it, we hope we don't lose affinity for delta, but lose its P-glycoprotein properties. And, and that's, he has a, about eight compounds that he and, a, and Wei Long, a postdoc of my group made. And Aladdin, who's sitting behind me, and you all know he's presented as part of the, the T training grant. He has just gotten the Delta and the mu opioid binding assays up and running, and he is now um, running this assay. And since he's starting it this week, he unfortunately, <laughs> you have no David to share for tonight. For today. Not not today. Not yeah. quite. Yeah. <laughs> published last <laughs> week's David yet? Not yet. <laughs> Not quite yet. <laughs> so, so it's it's something we're focusing on, and we hope that we hope one of these compounds works because you can see it has a, a toxic group in there that uh, that could be labeled with carbon eleven, and uh, we, we hope these compounds work. And another thing we talked about, and I talked to Jake about, is uh, you know he does the two FA uh, nicotine compounds, but the problem with that is its kinetics are, are really horrible. That you have to use bolus and fusion paradigm in order to quantify it. Uh, this tracer, I think he wrote in his K award that we're gonna switch over to that. That's F18 Fluvatine. Fluvatine has much better kinetics. It reaches equilibrium faster. Uh, I mean, if you, if you look at the 2FA, it takes hours for this to reach equilibrium. So, so this is faster in, in reaching equilibrium. And this is a study where they actually looked at it, uh, the uh, nicotine displacement study from someone smoking a cigarette and showing the different regions where you get displacement of the probe with a, in a cigarette smoker. So this is something that I talked to Jake about. I, I encourage him to switch over to F18 fluvatine because uh, those imaging studies of doing 2FA, the bolus infusion paradigm, which basically takes all day before you get them in the scanner, is really, really a headache, and I think you should consider switching over to that. So this is not directly in the pipeline, but since the precursor and standards are commercially available, we can have it in the pipeline very quickly. And, uh, where are those data? Uh, where are those data from? Okay, yeah, this is the one I uh, I, I ripped. So this is from Germany. They developed the pet tracer, um, and this is from Yale, I believe. The two, uh, yeah, the, the 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 study looking at the smokers is is from Yale. So yes, those are the. This is the slide I said in the beginning. That I, <laughs> I did not to add some references. <laughs> adequately uh, reference. Uh, is that, and, uh, so that's published? Th it's all published, yes. It's all published. I didn't put the site of references there. So. And that was also a fast, you said that would be a faster imaging session than what? It's bolus. You don't have to do bolus infusion. So that's it. You just do it. It's One much. goes and that's it. Yeah. I have two FA right now. We start the injection at night in the morning. Um, have to do six hour infusion, yeah. and then displacement is three to five. Yeah, it's it's a horrible, yeah. horrible. Mm -hmm. and, and and this I have a, a, a cardiology is carbon eleven and different tracers we're getting on up and running for the cardiology group here. I I show it because I, I highlighted this one carbon eleven acetoacetate and Prashant in, a, in our group is getting this up and running and and this measures ketone body metabolism. And the reason why I presented here is this is something that uh, Corinne Weirs is interested in doing as, as part of her K99 R00 grant. And we are making it, we are doing studies with cardiology right now, and we should be able to, to make it at levels for doing human imaging studies, uh, studies very, very soon. Uh, and finally, just quickly go through, you know, for those of you who are interested in, in doing pet studies, how do, how do you get started and how do you uh, get the ball rolling? Well, we have a very, very active IND support group here. We have um, a group here, 
and Aaron Schubert's group that actually works with the investigator and does project development. They pull all the protocols together and get all the documentation. Aaron works closely with Sharon in the Cyclotron facility. He gets the CMC together and all the other uh, production and quality assurance and release criteria for the IND and, and it works together with the IND core, which is uh, Kath Kathleen. Um, Kathleen Thomas. Kathleen Thomas runs that. And it's a, uh, I point this out because yeah, Kathleen Thomas, it's a very, very user friendly group. This is a, uh, a an organization that was established by Dave Mankoff when he came here and he's made it very user friendly. I think it's uh, with respect to going from initial discussions to having a, an approved IND, it's, it's really very quickly, it's, it's much quicker here than, than, than any other site that I'm, I'm aware of. It's a, a very user-friendly group, and, and now things like the P30 and the U19 are, infor are important because they provide infrastructure support for this, for, for our, uh, our neural engine pro uh, protocols. And here are the uh, um, different ongoing protocols we have on the things I, I discussed today. You see a lot on the the neuroinflammation with FAT NOS, we have new ones with uh, EDR28 and FAT NOS and neurodegeneration. We have the acetate program, uh, a protocol up and running with uh, Ilya Nasrallah. So, um, obviously, four, uh, we're no longer recruiting. We've uh, written off FTP, but, um, but uh, we hope to have a, a replacement for sometime in, in the near future. So, this is a a pretty active group, and, and remember, we haven't had a lot of core funding. A lot of this was done with, with ITNAT and pilot project funding that, uh, that that enabled us to ramp up to where we are today, and, and this will continue um, under the P30, and if I give this talk a, a year from now, I hope to be up to 9 or 10 with uh, new protocols that are supported by the P30 using perfetinol and the cathode compound and the... the yeah, we also have the Reagan. These are also active. Well, Duke brought this list of it. I mean, Reagan, I think, is. Yeah. Reagan is a great PI. And, and yeah, sure they are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that she, Reagan said, when she said this to me, she put the authorized user. Yeah. So, Reagan, yeah, there are already projects by the people from the people. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So, I, I, the second I one is Becky's. Yeah. The second one is Becky's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, what happens the, when that's you, the P30 pilot. Yeah. Yeah. So, Put your slides together an hour before you present <laughs> it. You cut and paste something to something send it's you fine. in the PowerPoint. And this slide just shows the, the, the people in the Mac group and uh, people in the Cyclotron facility. As this is my stop slide, so um, <laughs> it's the reason why it's there. But yeah, you can see here's the group that's uh, in the Cyclotron facility, and it's a it's a, a dated picture, but uh, not a lot of people doing a lot of work. <laughs> So uh, they, they really are a, a, a good, a good group, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, we're very fortunate. Yeah, we're, we're looking forward to wrapping and, up. And, and, and thank you for the introduction.